thankful to all the sponsors of the event, uh, Avon Core, Luno, SA Crypto, everybody else. Um, I love the presentations tonight. I hope you've enjoyed them. Um, I'm slightly left of field. I kind of don't belong here, but I'm going to take you on a different kind of journey um, before I start about the great financial reset. So there's three circles in my, my logo and great of mind of thinking. And the financial, the great financial reset is one of them. So we've got that little power button on the computer. It's got to happen. Uh, and I actually think it's not too far away, and I'll delve into that a little bit. Then there's the methodology. How and what do you do about the fact that this has happened? How do you trade? How do you plan? How do you do your wealth management, which is investment? It isn't all about nine screens and 24-7 days getting frazzled and frying your eyes. I don't believe in that. Um, so you've got to make wealth-based investment decisions. So that's the market snipe aspect. And then there's that third circle that brings us here and brings us this commonality, and that's this thing called crypto, it's occurred. It's always funny. Cometh the hour, cometh the man, they sometimes say. And in this great financial reset where we need a new monetary system, I find it almost a little bit too convenient that here's this alternative realm that's busy getting off its knees like this baby giraffe to get running. It almost feels orchestrated. So as you can see, I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm not, I don't give my trust too easily. I want to just hold out a couple of thoughts that might go slightly contrary to what was shared today. Crypto is great and it's going to play a great role, but marry your girlfriend, make her a wife, don't marry a tech. I don't know how this thing started. There's talk about the NSA in 1996 doing a paper that was very, very similar. Um, I do know control structures. I use the phrase often, and that's government, the rental extractors, the tax extractors. I consider them the enemy. They tie in with the dark state and intelligence services. I'm kind of a little bit conspiratorial. I have a feeling that they will never let you have your own money. The great power of uh, the Rothschild is I cannot make the laws as long as I control the creation of money. Um, and I think that there's been this beautiful thing that was created by this man who just disappeared and never collected any Nobel Prizes or awards and doesn't want too much of the money and he's just gone away. Beware the fairy tale of, for adults. We, we, we control our children with to stories about the uh, fairy godmother and Santa Claus and so we too are controlled. Um, but anyway, it may be true, I don't really know, um, but it's certainly going to play a role and I'm interested in it but I'm not married to it. Um, who knows? Who knows it's seeding? I think, however, for the great financial reset, which is going to be in my belief system, um, and that's not something I like to use, belief systems. It's usually something you were given and you never rationalized yourself into, so watch them. Um, but in my assessment of what's going down, this is going to be the economic case study for centuries to come, and they're going to ask, what the damn hell were those clowns thinking? Um, when they're doing case study of our generation, uh, of how we got here. So um, it's going to be significant, and it's coming, and it's going to be soon. I need to get that slide clicker. Uh, and I'm going to take you through a couple of things on how I think you should play this. There's certain things that I think will happen. I'm going to tie it in a little bit with gold. So we're going to take you around everything. Uh, and I'll finish with crypto and how I think it'll play out uh, with Bitcoin and how we biased ourselves. Um, broadly. And I think you need to have an investment plan. I think you probably if you, uh, you can have a trading plan um, and you also need almost geolocational plans to go with it. Um, because if you're constrained by one geography, you are also handicapped. Um, so I left South Africa, born and bred South African, um, left South Africa in 99, worked in London, uh, living in Cyprus. I'm now visiting you again in Zimbabwe uh, for six months, and I'll be off to Acapulco. So I like to be mobile. I don't trust the control structure, and I like to arbitrage not just the great, as Avant Corps were discussing, really interesting topic. Don't just arbitrage tr at a trading level, arbitrage at a general level, which could be citizenship, a residency, and many other things. Okay, the great financial reset. What am I here to tell you? Uh, potential chronology of events. I think it's important to understand dominoes are going to start falling. Which ones fall first? Because unfortunately, you don't get to just stand in one place and the whole thing bypasses you. It's like stepping stones. I don't know if you ever played the games. If any of you are gamers, you jump on the stepping stone and and then that one starts sinking, and then you've got to leap onto the next. There's going to be an element that things are going to go up, down, and there's going to be wild swings. Um, and this is not going to be the faint-hearted. Most people who are going to be passive are going to be de um, devastated by this. In short, my assessment is this is going to be a polarizing event for wealth for individuals. 
In other words, the ostrich masses that have their heads in the ground are going to get the kick in the jacksie they probably uh, deserve for not managing their financial wealth and trusting governments and other systems. Um, and those that understand and have looked into the crypto space and also know at other off assets, off blockchain assets, how to position will do a whole bunch uh, better. So make sure you're one of those that are a little bit more awake and are considering various uh, aspects. Okay, for some of you thinking what collapse or how bad is it or why is it, just a quick few points. I think most of you are there already on the page. So I'm not going to spend too long preaching to the uh, choir here. Um, but debt. So Reinhardt and Rogoff. Uh, we had some economists here today who've done some interesting study. Uh, they are prominent economists, and basically it's accepted that once you get to 90% debt levels, um, adding further debt is become, starts to become counterproductive. Um, I've had to size down the slide pack uh, for the time speaking slot, but in essence, China right now are probably getting $1 uh, of GDP growth for every $9 of debt created. That's clearly not economic. In other words, it's kind of like me selling um, 10 Rand notes here to you for one Rand. It's just a bad, bad deal, and you go out of business in time. What else is going to happen? Growth is slowing globally. I'll talk why I say that. It's probably accepted broadly in most uh, areas. Growth is slowing, which dovetails with the excessive GD, uh, debt levels. Um, it's not only government debt, it's corporate debt this time. So subprime was all about um, the, the individuals in subprime housing and then the toxic debt they created that was supposed to be investment instruments that they introduced into the banking system in the search for yield. Those all uh, went bust. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were terrible assets, and now we're having a different kind of subprime. We've got subprime cars, we've got subprime student loans. I'm talking a lot about the U.S., so I'm, I'm quite global. It's not going to be all South African here. Some of you will have heard of this. And then there's corporate debt. At the moment, the interest rates are so low that it's worth your while for a corporation to get over-leveraged in debt to retire your equity because you pay more in dividends and earnings than you're currently paying on your debt. What does that encourage? It encourages excessive debt. By the way, you've got to remember the people that are agents for these companies, the managements and the CEOs, they're interested in hitting their stuff off options number and bonus. So it's really helpful if you can borrow a whole bunch and give this wall of money that chases up your own market. So you actually have companies like Coca-Cola that are contracting, they're making less money, they've got far more debt and they're worth twice as much than a decade ago. Um, so it's absolutely phenomenal and it's a perversion and it's a perversion as a result of excessive debt. Um, and it's bending out of the Gini curve. The corporate elite are getting super rich at your expense. They're getting highly leveraged. They're going to be too big to fail. And when it comes time to bail them out, you're going to be paying and you never got any of the upside and they'll never have any of the downside. We've seen this movie before. We saw it in 2008. They're going to run it again on you. Are you going to get it this time before the sequel comes and visits you? It's coming. Okay. Spectre of low zero and negative interest rates. Great to see it already handled by awesome speakers just before me, by the way. I really enjoyed listening to them all. It's an absolute perversion in Denmark. You can go purchase a house with a mortgage and it automatically reduces. So it's an encouraging of debt. The concept of saving and having a positive carry has been thrown out the window. And one of the key uh, reasons they want to kill cash. One of the key reasons they want to kill cash and create a cashless society for me um, is so that they can bring on negative interest rates. Because as long as you can put something under your mattress and it hasn't got less, if you put 10,000 under your mattress, it'll still be 10,000 unless you've been visited, is on account of the negative interest rates. It's also one of the reasons why gold uh, will play a role as well. I'm going to talk about yield inversion. It's kind of technical and most people's eyes will glaze over. I'm going to explain it in layman's terms. Just if I could do half as well as the gentleman at the back did blockchain, by the way, that was awesome. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm going to steal that one. Um, I, I don't know if you've got IP on it or whatever. But uh, I'm going to do, uh, I'm definitely going to do uh, that one, uh, although my grandma is long gone. Um, yield inversion. So we'll do yield inversion. I'll explain why it's so important and why it's almost 100% indicator. And it's already happened. And I think we're a foot away from falling off into the next uh, pit, uh, although it's being denied by the talking heads on CNBC, which is a perfect contra indicator because you don't go to there for the truth, do you? Um, so Goldman Sachs, uh, the broker, the, 
the banker, Draghi, was in charge. It's typical. Uh, that's where we hire from, apparently, for central bankers. We get one vampire from one vampire institution to run another vampirical institution. Well, now, actually, they've gone away with that, and they put a complete politician who's non-financial in charge. Um, and it's a lady, nothing about the gender. Uh, but she's going to be political rather than financial. And in my view, it's because there's political events coming. In other words, it's no longer going to be driven by financial and economic events. We're going into a political season in terms of the financial system. The euro in itself structured as a political uh, instrument. You can't have different fiscal policy and st uh, static monetary policy for all the different uh, countries. If you have German savers you uh, and you have Greek spenders, you can't have the same monetary rate. It was designed to fail, gentlemen, in my opinion. I think people are smart enough to know that. Therefore, once again, I don't trust. And I think we all globally are being synchronized to be over-indebted to fail together so that we can have the problem reaction and the subsequent solution that's been planned for us. Um, that might sound a bit radical. I don't know. Maybe I'm a nutter. Um, by the way... <laughs> I loved, uh, I loved Nick's speech. I'm not going to take a magic mushroom ever again in the same light uh, after thinking about all those little blockchains I'm swallowing. Um, anyway, uh, non-dollar central banks. So the non-dollar central banks uh, are universally buying gold. Why are they doing that? Gold's a, a barbaric relic. That's what Warren Buffett told us. That's what everyone's doing. Germany, after 21 years of not buying gold, is now buying gold. And they're asking for their gold back from America. And America says, uh, uh, seven years, please. What? How long does it take to load up a, uh, a boat? Anyway, too much uh, yield comparison. Um, go straight to the yield. I think we've got to cover this. But I'm also, uh, I'm also interested in the political angles that are coming. So uh, also mentioned today was a little bit of the green element, and I call it the watermelon communism that's coming for us. The watermelon communism. Who doesn't want a safer planet? Who doesn't want a more efficient? It's like voting against motherhood. But let me tell you, there's a little sting to this one. You get to pay for it. It's the excuse for new taxes. Um, I have the opinion that oil is largely being killed. We've had uh, the total peak oil demand. I've done a lot of YouTubes on that. By the way, follow the channel, um, the Market Sniper and the Crypto Sniper. I do a lot of YouTubes on all of these and the Reset Sniper. Uh, oil is going to be, uh, the peak demand has passed and that actually is going to be falling off and away. That's why, wait for it, the Saudis are doing the biggest single listing. When you need a patsy in the room, what, what better than your citizens to unload at the top of the market? I think some of that's going to, is the reason. But anyway, why is, why is the slide up here? The IMF. The IMF have decided quantitative easing is an active policy for financing and funding all the requirements for the green, uh, the fact that our planet's going to end in 10 years' time, apparently, according to Greta, a 14-year-old girl. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that because you're going to get to pay for that one. Um, and they talk about quantitative easing. I'll try to highlight it. There's a bit of overexposure on the screen there, um, but I'll put it up on SlideNet, and if you drop an email, you can get all the slides. But that's what they're saying. So here's a, a trans-global organization of dubious um, assessment. The original United Nations buildings, by the way, donated by the Rockefeller, as was 9-11. They were the New York ports and harbor. They gave that land, very kind of them, actually, uh, and everything else that went with it. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so wh what, do you, what you have here is the IMF that's been set up by them and is now telling you that we're going to have perpetual QE on account of a green agenda. How's that going to turn out for your currency? You know, I, I left 20 years ago. I can tell you in the RAND, I never used to get a leopard. You know what a leopard is? That 200 RAND note, that was like big Tom, 200. Now I have to draw like three grand and it's gone in no time. And I'm just fistfuls of leopards and what can I buy with this? Next to nothing in Rand. It's when you travel around and you see other fiat currencies that you realize these guys are proliferating like no tomorrow. Um, anyway, so the IMF is going to play a role uh, and it's going to come dressed in green. Your communists, your Bolsheviks, your global Bolsheviks, they want to control you. You're going to come dressed in green. Uh, and how can you say no? Because... It's for the children. You're destroying their planet. Okay, back to the yield inversion narrative. Back to the yield inversion narrative. Here you have it. Um, some of you might remember 87. I started my investing career in 87. Um, I decided it was a great idea to get into the stock market. I was about to go in the army for two years. That's, they still did that. Um, and I, uh, of course, failed at university. Someone said I had a BSc. I had a shot at it. It was actuarial science. I hated it. <laughs> Uh, I threw in the towel, uh, and then I went straight into the army. Uh, and, I, and I went in August 87, and I just had a dead aunt uh, who left me some money in the UK, and I put the whole job lot in the stock market. And then I got a wake-up call, and I'd lost about 45% of my money, my entire net worth. So that was my beginning in investment, and it was love at first bite, I can say. Anyway, so 87, 
um, you had a yield curve inversion. Some of you will, most of you will definitely remember the dot-com uh, 2000 and the aftermath uh, of that. It was rather chilling. Um, I actually think we went technically into our first global depression there. They never say a depression. How many, everyone knows the, the statistical or the, the, what the phrase is for recession, what you need to be in a recession. How many here actually know the, the definition of a depression? Anyone, put up your hand. Negative growth. Negative growth for two quarters is a recession. What's a depression? Two successive quarters. A depression is for an entire year with systemic bank failure. I think we started that process actually in .com, but we definitely hit it in 2007-08. The biggest monetarist criminal, Alan Greenspan, performed his liquidity experiment where he dropped rates so, so low and then reinflated uh, after 2000 and gave us the property boom that led to so many people being sold the dream by George Bush, that ninja loans being put in homes then on reset rates of two years and then being thrown out. Um, so it was, it was really a big mess around. Anyway, that was the second yield Inver uh, inversion. And what is the yield inversion? So I said I'd explain it. Let's do it really simple. The government likes to borrow from you. Apart from taxing you, they also want to borrow from you. So what do they do? They have long-term borrowing where you can say, give it back to me in 30 years' time, or they have short-term borrowing, give it back to me in five or 10 years or even two or three months' time. And technically, the yield curve should go up. The longer you're giving them your money, you should be paid a higher interest rate. The shorter you're giving them your money, you should be paid a lower interest rate. What happens when people, uh, when too much demand starts pushing on one side of the curve is it inverts. In other words, they have to try attract short-term money, and their rate ends up going up, and everyone is absolutely bricking it and scared and tying up their money long term for very low rates. It's called inversion. That's usually a fear signal. It's a very strong fear signal. It's a 100% signal. We dipped again, as you can see, 0708. You'll all remember that. And we've just done it now. We've just done it now. And note, it doesn't happen when you dip in the red. It's in the recovery back up that it all starts. So this is a leading indicator. Most indicators lag. In technical analysis, you hear me damn most technical indicators for lagging. I'm only interested in leading indicators. This, for economics, is a leading and almost 100% shoe-in. So I'm afraid to say I'm the bearer of bad news. I'm delivering some doomsday porn for you all here. Um, it's going to get rough. Uh, and this is at a global level. Um, so let's talk about uh, precious metals. Precious metals. Okay, so we had a blow-off boom. That all started the quantitative easing. When they first broke cover with quantitative easing for the first time after 2008, we absolutely mooned it. This is against the dollar, by the way, and we went right up to 1,927. We predicted new highs for gold. We even gave targets, and it overshot our targets, which left us a bit bewildered, because we like to be right, but we like to take all the money the market wants to give us, not only a third of it, so we're a bit, uh, a bit upset. Uh, and we changed our theory, and it won't happen again. And then it had like anything, overperformance begets future underperformance. This is the same in sport. Any English rugby fans out there? <laughs> Semi final to final? Yep. And so it is in the fight game, so it is in business, so it is in life, so it is as a trader. We actively talk each other down after a big win because you're going to be too arrogant, you're going to be too sloppy, and you're going to give it all back. It's the natural psychology of things. Anyway, in the same way markets, too many people became buy at any price. I can't bear to hear about my mate making all the money and I'm not. Just get me in. We've had the same in Bitcoin. We had the same in .com. What do you do? You have a massive bear as it takes a while for years of narrative to unwind and people to just give up and lose interest. So we had a proper bear. Then we got that squeeze. So what did I say during the squeeze? Well, you've got a rounded bottom there. Oh, who doesn't like a rounded bottom. Um, anyway, got a rounded bottom. And on top of that, you've got yourself what we call an HVF method, um, hunt volatility funnel method, a squeezing of volatility. A squeezing of volatility occurs when there's a lot of compression. Price is reaching a point of agreement. It's getting really tight. In other words, the buyers are coming up, but they're not ready to charge. And the sellers are saying, yeah, it's coming up a bit. I'll let go of a little bit. There's a little, let go of a little bit. And the volume is drifting off and it's tightening, it's tightening. Later, you get, it's a continuation pattern, by the way, not a reversal. Uh, later, you get a subsequent major uh, impulsive move. And we're interested as traders in very tight risk, so we want to set a nice little tripwire for the bear to step through at the high probability place where we know that he can see the deer and he's still in the tree line and the reward is right there, and we like to keep the stop really tight so we're not risking too much and we can trade bigger. And we like the impulsiveness the volatility returning gives us because it gives you a massive reward. 
So everything we do is high reward to tight risk. It means you might lose a few more, your losses are taken quickly, our, losses are, our winners are held for a long time. Every successful trader holds his trades for a long time, um, longer than his losses. Losses quick, trades uh, winners long. Uh, beginners, they hold on to their losers, they really want them to come back, they hate to be wrong, um, and they snatch a profit the first time they've offered it. Yeah? So you've got to watch that. If you, any of you are trading and active or even investors in the market, watch that tendency, please. So anyway, it's gold versus the dollar. Um, this is gold versus the euro. So you might think, um, wow, gold's going up against the dollar. It's going up against everything fiat currency. In other words, gold and Bitcoin, because I'm, this is a crypto crowd. Uh, I'm totally with you. We're going to bring the crypto into it. But gold is the original crypto in, in that sense. It's just non-electronic. In fact, there was a guy who started e-gold in America, and he was rounded up, arrested, and put away, and he had a, a solid ounce for everybody that gave him money of gold. There was nothing fraudulent about him. He's getting more life sentences than a serial killer. Um, that's how serious they are about not you, not undermining their money system. Um, anyway, so this is against the euro. This is another HVF, as we call it. I won't get technical. The squeeze, the burst, the fast move, it's awesome. You sit tight, and you let it run and you stay in the trade. The money's made actually in the sitting, guys, not the order entry, not jumping in and out. The money's made in the sitting, and that's uh, the value of method. That's against the pound. Can you see a similar structure each time? It doesn't matter what each central bank is saying. They're all cheats. They're all proliferating it. They might be doing it at different times to different levels, but if you're playing an anti-fiat, you get the same DNA with marginal differences dependent on each of the currencies. By the way, we called a big property crash in Australia. They kind of skipped through the 208 because China was creating so much money and chucking it their way. They almost skipped right through uh, the last one. So they've had a double boomer property. And we said, guys, short the Aussie. They're going to deflate their currency harder than any of the others. And make sure you've got your gold if you're in Australia. That's how it looks in Australia. That's already met first target, and we expect overperformance to that. So that's why you should have gold. I'm going to introduce you to a gold and silver ratio. So we compare things to each other. Now, silver is like the little sister to big brother gold. And when things get running, she runs even faster. She runs, she's higher beta. That's what's called a higher beta. But when it's bad, it's real bad, she wets the bed. Um, when it's good, she's off like a dirty sock on laundry day, and you have that ratio. One single uh, gold uh, ounce at the current moment went as high as 90. At the top of those two red lines, you, don't, you could get 90 silver ounces. Now, this is an inverse relationship. What does he mean? It means opposite is good. That means when this gets very high, the metals are at all time under valuation. So when you have a very high... Gold to silver ratio. One gold ounce gets you how many ounces of silver? This is historic, by the way. The 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the ratio was 15. We're at 90 now. The modern history post the modern economic theory, whatever we want to call it, the voodoo and magic they pull, um, it's been about 25, 30. Uh, and at the moment, we're at, uh, we w hit as high as 90, and we're in the mid-80s. By the way, that subprime collapse, that was when gold went to 1927 and silver went to $50. You could have bought it at two or three. Not quite crypto returns, but not too shoddy, if you don't mind me saying. Um, that's at 30. It collapsed from 90 to 30. So the silver was running three times faster than an already fast running gold. So you get a multiplier on a multiplier there. Okay? We're at a, we, this technical analysis is a rising wedge. And the, any, of, any of you know a bit of charting? Any hands here? Some charters? Rising wedge? What typically happens on a rising wedge? should break down to the downside. Both correct. Yes, indeed. So rising wedges, especially how do you feel about a rising wedge that's taken since 2011 till today, and what I'd call an eight-year, nine-year mega rising wedge? Should it be a small move or should it be proportionate in scale? Likely proportion in scale. You can't say for sure, but proportion in scale. So we had a downside break, and we have a retest in. So we touched the highest side, which is an all-time high, and we're starting to get jittery up there. It's looking down and saying, blimey, that's a big fall. Um, and it breaks, and then it gets a little bit nervous, and it scurries back in. That's the beginning of an unraveling. Um, so I also hope for some of you that you consider for yourselves. I have no uh, dog in this fight. I make no money if you do it. You'll only push the prices higher for me, uh, but that you have some silver and gold in your possession. Do not give it to a vault or a bank. That's kind of like giving your babies to the Epstein cartel. Um, don't do it. Um, so a couple of equity shares for you. Um, 
majestic. I really, really like it. Similar structure. Major, major squeeze uh, coming on. And hyper potential risk reward. Again, we've got a target of that well over 36. It's trading in and around um, tens at the moment. So there will be equities that are exposed to precious metals that you can also explore. I know you crypto guys, you're not all equity traders. That's fine. We'll get to the crypto. But consider a broad strategy. If things get really ugly, so I've looked at a lot of countries where they've had a system of a down. I was traveling to Ukraine prior to the the Maidan events, um, I suddenly noticed at the airports they stopped giving me Grievna for my uh, British pounds because I was traveling from London. And this was a year and a half before all the stuff went down. I th and then afterwards I thought about it and I thought, how come they aren't stocking this stuff anymore? Did they know something? Anyway, they didn't give me Grievna anymore. And then eventually when everything went down, guys that had Porsche Cayernes there, they shut the banks down. You couldn't draw more than $50. It's also the Cyprus situation. What happens? You get constrained by how much money you can draw. Everybody gets pinched. There's no liquidity for you. Uh, people are selling their brand new cars for 20% of the value for hard cash, and you have that crisis. We could have, I'm not being alarmist, but there could be an element of that at a global scale. So you've seen microcosms of this, Cyprus, Ukraine, Zimbabwe. Anybody remember that? But what Bitcoin hit on Zimbabwe, uh, I think it was a year or two ago, it was three or four times uh, the height. So watch out uh, for um, grid down, because what use is Bitcoin if we don't have electricity, mobile network, or internet network? Um, there can be circumstances where electronic money can be limiting. Okay, there's a couple of equities, another falling wedge in another rounded bottom. All of those things I'm deeply in love with. Um, and I'd suggest that's worth taking a look at. That's an, um, uh, an, equ that's an ETF, sorry, of gold and silver miners. So this is what happens. The, the ETFs and the equities lag because they so bared out. They're so dispassionate. They're so, so many cries of wolf, they don't believe it anymore. So gold and silver starts moving, and what ends up happening is they don't respond. It's like, yeah, no, I've seen this one before. And you're about to dump again, and we're about to go crashing back down. No, we're not buying. Thank you. You've cried wolf 413 times. It's not, gonna, it's not ever happening. And then what happens is the metal keeps moving, and it keeps moving, and then it keeps building and base building, and suddenly the, the, the news for the, the fundamentals for the metal start improving, and then stocks suddenly think, Jesus, we better get our running shoes on and they jump up and they try to play catch up. So you can get a bit of that, uh, it's still early doors. That's a falling wedge on equities, gold miners ETF. Uh, that's that falling wedge I was showing you on a smaller time frame. So I've gone from the big chart just into that little red circle that I was showing you. Again, that's a continuation pattern for upside. We like a falling wedge because there's a pinch. Who doesn't like to have a pinch in the right places? Over there, you've got it and you'll trade beautifully off that. Okay, a little bit about on money and proliferation of M2. So China. You can't see the numbers. Luckily, I, I, I remember them. Um, but China's got 450 tons of gold. Um, I'll bring this back to RSA and mining. South Africa's fallen way down there. That's the top 10. We're in eighth position for gold. By the way, at our peak in the 70s, when the rand was uh, parity to the pound or close to parity and, and better than the dollar, we had 1,000 tons. So China at 450, it's, it's really not a lot, but that's if we believe their stats as well. Um, then you go down Australia, Russia, United States, etc. So we're no longer a gold producer, but I'm going to show you something that's interesting. If gold goes up, ah, oh, it's such a pity, you, there's two lines on there. The gold price is the upper one, and I've highlighted when the gold price goes down, the rand goes down. So there's a bit of a correlation with the rand, even though it's not a big part of our economy, it's relatively quite high. But it's also an anti-dollar. It means the dollar's getting weak, and then the rand obviously does better against the dollar. So you're getting the anti-dollar effect with the gold. Now recently gold's gone up, but unfortunately the rand in that last piece that I'm showing you with a question mark, with gold having gone up, has not responded. Um, so the FX emergings are battling. And I've dived in a little bit tighter time frame. I'm sorry for this that the charts are a little bit overexposed there, um, but again you can see the divergence. So the blue line is the aggregate gold up, and actually we've gone down on the rand despite normally getting a little bit of support when gold's going up, and then when gold's going down, really falling through the floor. So it was RAND, uh, USD, Rizal versus gold that you've been looking at. And there's a bit of an uncoupling. So I'm a bit concerned about FX emergings. Guess what? Most of you live here, I'm assuming. Um, you should have a plan. Have a plan, Bitcoin, gold, silver, talk to your Luno guys, start getting some other assets in. 
Um, then, the, yeah, so that's the divergence. I've also done it for Mexican peso, so I don't think it's only RAND. Some of you will think, yeah, the state-owned enterprises, all the Zuma stuff's coming out, it's all bad about us. I think generally it's going to be, so that's the tequila crisis as well that I'm rolling in here. I think emergings are all going to have a problem. Um, so it's not specific only to the RAND. So my biggest trade, actually, I've not put on here because I wasn't sure how much time to get. Uh, I'd have and how to involve you. So before I get into the crypto side, I want to talk about the Korean one and Southeast Asia. Um, so China trade wall, this Trump trade wall punch and Judy show that they're putting on for you here um, and managing, there's a reason for that. It's kind of like subprime. It started out, mm, certain banks are having concerned about the state of the housing market. This is all pre the Lehman first starts getting soft and then really accelerates down. There's always a couple of stages or amplification in a crisis. I think this China trade war is the beginning of something. So the Chinese yuan has been proliferated to the tune of 28 trillion in money M2. So that's money supply. That's notes, digits in the computer. Um, 14 trillion the state. So everyone wants the dollar to die. But let's just talk about how much these guys have put out there. They've got a kind of peg. The Hong Kong dollar has a kind of peg. Um, what you've got is way too much fiat that was created largely during the 2008 and 9. China became the main driver globally during that period. We were all on the bones of our ass the, during the West during that 10-year period. And they got heavily, heavily leveraged and they've overshot. Some people were saying the cities they've built, the roads, etc., well into the future. They brought a whole bunch of growth that should be happening at a more normal rollout pace forward into the here and now, and there's not much construction work left because you future-proofed yourself to 2,300 uh, and the, the 5 billion future citizens you'll have. So they've got into uh, a little bit of a problem. So my suspicion is this trade wars is going to turn out to be the narrative for a major reset in the yuan relative to the dollar. But you're saying, hey, you're saying the dollar's going to go up. Actually, the, the global currency failure is not going to see the dollar just fall. There's lots of people who want the dollar just to fall. Here's the thing, and I, Graham very aptly touched on it earlier in his talk. He said, you, you borrow into existence the first dollar, but where's the interest payments that's due by contract on that dollar? So what actually happens is you need to borrow more dollars. Who can create dollars? Only America. So if you're South Africa with dollar-based debt, how do you get more dollars to pay those extra interest payments as well as the capital back? Well, we're never paying the capital back, but just to serve the interest. You have to sell an absolute load of goods to America. Are we running a massive trade surplus with America? Or are many of the other third world nations running massive trade? No, they're not. So what actually ends up happening is all emerging nations are always on a losing wicket against the dollar because they are desperately in need of dollar. This is known as the dollar milkshake theory. Um, it's kind of like everyone puts a straw and everyone's trying to get some of the milkshake and you end up not getting a full milkshake because there's five other blokes with the same straw in the same bottle. Um, so you'll, you'll quickly get an idea about that. Google it, YouTube it, it's hysterical and it's true. Um, so actually we're going to have, in the bizarre sense, a shortage of dollars. Yes, they printed a whole bunch, but how does China, that's not even 1% of the SWIFT system, with twice the amount of M2 as America, get away with that? without re-rating downwards something awful. And what does that do for any debt that they have? Well, they have one trillion in bonds that are positive, but it's a very difficult system. So the global fiat system is like the circle of dominoes. And you have lots of small ones, like the emerging nations, on the periphery. They get to die first when the barbarian horde comes. And the dollars, the dominoes get bigger as you head to the middle, and in the real middle, uh, middle is the queen domino, the tallest of them all, the dollar. Um, you have the euro, the pound, the yen, and all of these others sort of semi-core, um, and then you have the peripheral. So we fall inwards from the periphery inwards. And actually, when they fall, where does that demand, no longer wanting to hold, Turkish lira, Mexican peso go, a large part of it actually will go into the dollar. So in the weird sense, part of the failure will actually be dollar appreciation. But of course we're hoping there's going to be a big enough gate also into Bitcoin and into gold and into silver, into non-fiat options as well. So it's not going to 100% go, but don't think the dollar collapses. The dollar's measured is a crap currency being measured against other crap currencies. So it's a relative degree of crap. It's a fertilized farm. Which one st stinks more? Well, it's all pretty stinky. Um, so here's crypto. So I want to get over this concept of you have to be at your desk, 
putting in orders, reacting to the market, knowing the new stream and hyper. We don't do that kind of trading. We call it lifestyle trading. We're trying to sell a bit of sizzle, I suppose, guilty, but we don't do Lambos and girls in bikinis. I think that's uh, for the scam artists. But we do say you don't have to be permanently at your screen. You decide a trade. You have a trigger level. You have your stop and you have your take profit and you walk. You write the check for that trade. You've got to justify it for yourself. Each trade is like a business plan. We do all our work before. We do 360 degree view. We look at it across everything. Is the dollar week? Is the oil week? What's gold doing? And what the cryptos are doing? What are the alts doing relative to Bitcoin? You do full on analysis and then you decide what you're going to do. And we have a method for that. And it's called the HVF method. And we made a number of key decisions. I put up S first because most of you know it. I'll finish on Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum. And I've done this in a log chart, so it's a bit distorting. Do you go, does everyone understand a log scale? It's in percentage, because otherwise you get very big hockey sticks and very flat charts. So it's a log scale. Um, so actually that Ethereum was in and around the $340, but that green line up to the top was $2,400. Looks a bit disproportionate, but it was a mega spike. That was a, a beautiful HVF. We went long Ethereum, and we weren't in Bitcoin. So I'm not a hater. Just because I'm going to tell you about some shorts, I'm not a hater of crypto. I'm ambivalent. I want to buy something that's going up, and I also want to hold certain things that will see me through reset. So we have an investment strategy. We have a number of dials. An investment strategy for crypto. Then we have a trading account. And then I have the Super Ligera Lamborghini account, which is your BitMEX account, with a 10x, 20x, 30x leverage, and that's a shoot for the moon. You all have a demon that wants it. So what you do is you control how much money and you put your demon and you control where he plays. Then you do your 3 to 5 leverage on your Kraken, your Bitstamp and your Lunos. And then you have your 1 is to 1, your Coinbase, your Lunos and you just buy. And that is either you're in fiat or you're in the coin. That will never be lost generally and it's typically quite a long term. So we make 3 or 4 decisions a year. So you would have gone long F and you could have held for quite a while. We had signals to sell out. I'm showing you other points at 440. We said it was going to run that previous low and it was going to go in a bear. So we've actually been very negative Ethereum and the alt for a long time now. People hate, hate me a little bit because everyone's like, when's the alt going to run? You always so bear on it. And the Bitcoin dominance keeps reasserting and the others just keep being very looky-likey. I know there's different tech with a lot of them, but there's also an awful amount of looky-likeys and I think we need a clean out of all the small shit coins, if I can excuse the phrase, uh, that are out there. And that will be the beginning of the end. You need the death for the renewal. After the fire, the grass grows green. Without the fire, you still have a lot of scrub underneath it. So we, we went short at 440. We, we went short again at 200. That was the bear market of 6,000 Bitcoin as well, where we got nasty YouTube comments and we really hated there because we said it was going to go lower. There was a long in this mini recover, but generally, guys, the alts, if you throw a Fibonacci, anyone know Fibonacci? Great, there's a few of you technically right from the top to the beginning of uh, the, the, the bottom of the bear market. So from the top to the beginning of the bear, all the alts are sub 23.6 with a possible exception of Binance uh, and one or two others. That means they've not gone further than 23%. Most of them are well below. I'm talking about 5 or 10. Ethereum is about 4.5% away from that all-time low compared to the 2,400 up there. Why are you buying those damn things for your investment? They're giving you the deadest cat bounce. The cat is properly dead. It's three weeks old dead and ridden over by a steamroller. And you're looking it in the eyes and saying, do you still love me? <laughs> Come on. There's one guy there that's re that rallied. And he went well past the 61.8. And I sit there pissing on people's parade that want to buy alts until the market shows me. The truth is the chart. It's not what they say, it's what they do. Oh, but we've got new devs and new dApps and new everything. And I'm like, why is no one investing in your coin? Simple as that. The people, more people are investing in your coin, the coin goes up. It's simple as that. God's handwriting on the wall is the chart. So I always refer to the chart. The more amazing the story, the more likely there's a ramp. The same with Ripple. Ripple is flat as a pancake, and everyone, it's IMF's new coin, and we've done this, and they're announcing corporate major announcements every flipping day, and you get a, a spike and a complete fizzle. Those are short as paradise. Oh, there's still some optimists out there. Let's load up. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Short them back down. Um, let them give you your free money. Okay, so don't, don't, buy, don't buy the news. Look at the chart. Analyze the chart. Have method. Be trained on that and understand what you're looking at. Be part of a community, I will say. Why? Because I'm selling a community. I'm part of it. My community helped me, so I'm talking my book. But it makes sense to me, and it could make sense to you. So we've been buy a short on Ethereum. I've done a little bit of cross-crypto because I think there's part chance 
that Bitcoin might start getting a little bit of a bid under it now. There's a key level at the 6,000 to 65. I'll show you Bitcoin. So that's where we were really hated. I'm going to have to point it. Does this one have the laser? No. Over here, 6,000 to 6,800. I did little yellow highlights, but you won't see it. Um, that was a critical, critical level where we spent a lot of time. So I do analysis that's called volume by price. So what that does is I take all the data of volume that traded across many, many exchanges. But instead of having histograms that are vertically under the candles that just tell you on that day how much trade went by or on that week, I throw it across the price. Where did the bulk of the volume occur at a price level? And the price level is right through that 6,200 to 6,500 range on Bitcoin. So the volume by price chart, you won't see it, but it's a horizontal histogram. That is a huge histogram. The market really wanted to hold that level. We said, no, it's going to go, it's going to go. But if they made a good fist of trying to defend it for a long, long time. And also, you spent a lot of time there. You can see it. So each day is being accumulated at that 6,000 level. So what happened or where are we now? Well, we're coming back down. Imagine that yellow area that I tried to highlight there that you probably can't see running all the way through. We're coming back down from the top side again. Could we support this time? Maybe. I think there's a slightly better chance than this time. I'll watch the price behavior. If it gives me a continuation pattern, it's going lower. If it gives me a reversal pattern, it could be basing out. So there's some optimism for the Bitcoin guys that are a bit upset. We did say at 10,000, get out of all your investment. All our community sold at 10K. They've now got 30 or 40% more Bitcoin. It's worth, it's worth the sub fees on that one trade alone. I, I talk about three or four key decisions on the major time frame charts, guys. Not sitting on five minutes, twiddling, jumping in and out of traffic. You're going to get run over. It's not a game of Frogger. There's steamrollers out there. They're going to crush you. Um, do this. Don't make the exchanges rich. Build your own wealth. Short, small, key moment decisions. Three or four years. And that's it. So I'm showing you basically most of what we did. We traded long from 5,000. We weren't the first. We didn't wait for it. We thought it could continue downstairs at the 3.2. We waited for it. It showed us. It's going up. Okay. You've shown that you're done. We're going long. And we ran a large part of that. You don't need the whole move. Forget the fantasy, buying the low, selling the high. Get that middle chunk. That's the game. And we have method to do that. By the way, we put these on YouTube. So if you're not following me, you're missing the freeze. That's the 6,004. BT to trade 3595 target, possible overperformance, September the 17th. All dated. I don't change any of my YouTubes, all my tweets. I don't delete them. The wrong ones out there as well. Go find them. Go, you, you lied or you were wrong. Doesn't matter. It's okay. It's not about wrong. It's about making money. We will be wrong. It's a probability based uh, situation. So we're going to be wrong, but we get the probabilities in our favor. So that's down there. You can see it. And also, we were warning that it's going to go down. Look at that Georgian hat and sunglasses. How can you not trust a man's opinion with that? Um, and that was calling at, we're going to go to 6.8, and at the time we were $10,000. So we're going to trade. That was a geometric generated target from what we analyzed, and it was saying on the long-term charts, we overcooked. We're going to come off. Guess what? It's a valuable decision to get out at 10K. We are largely finished um, all the slides. What do I think? I've got two more for you. So that was the first one, just saying, guys, shooting star. These were monthly charts. We look at big time trains. Everyone says technical analysis just for timing fundamentals for the decision. No, you're just looking at two smaller time frame charts. Look at a big chart, then you'll get the decision of what it's going to do. There you go, two shooting stars and that's how it is today. Um, so that's the recent move. You could have avoided that pain, you hodlers, without being a day trader. You could have 30% more Bitcoin, you make that decision four times in a year, you won't get every single one right. You could have doubled the Bitcoin in a single year of four decisions, possibly two and a half. So here's the bit that you want to hear, what do I think will next? This is my probability-based scenario of what I think comes next for Bitcoin. It's my final slide. I've overstood my time. Um, I'm going to be dragged off the stage here. Um, 20K, 3K, 14K, I think we're at the bottom, or we might probe a little bit lower. I'm kind of 55 that we're close to bo uh, bottoming out here. Um, but because of the 6K that I described as a very, very significant, I think this time we might support or we just run it a little bit. But I don't think we're running that 3K low. I think we're going to hold. I think buyers are coming up under because the great reset is coming. They're bailing out banks overnight on the repo rate, by the way. It's coming. Um, and we're selling across the top. There's still too many wounded people from the 2017. They say there's a mourning period. They actually have a monk's name in technical analysis for death, how long you mourn. It's the same for traders. When you get your 
ass properly handed to you in a major pump move and then a dump. And that's kind of what happens. So those people are hurting. Um, so we have a secondary bull and we have a secondary bear. This is constriction. I think you're about to have the super macro continuation pattern of Bitcoin's entire existence. How's that for drama? In other words, I think a substantial move out of this will overperform and is of a scale not to be seen. And I expect it to coincide with the great financial reset. So those hodlers that have taken the pain, you may still end up right. I'm just going to suggest to you, wouldn't you like to be right with four or five times more Bitcoin than you've got now? Um, so that's the difference. By the way, I think timing might coincide with the US election as well. So I think Trump will get in again. This is speculation on my behalf. So he's, he's a natural antagonist. That's what he's supposed to be doing. He's antagonizing everybody. They'll put him in again, and they'll crash the thing on him. That's what they did with Bush. They crashed the whole thing. So they want a Republican. They want a conservative white male, and they want to crash it on him. And they say, you see, you can't let these guys drive anymore. They're useless. And they're going to do the same again uh, with Trump, I suspect. I suspect. That's a bit of political nuance. That's me just... What, what the hell? What could happen? So we focus on forward looking. We look back, what can we learn? And we apply it forward. And then we look at narrative and we see what's happening. And he's creating this China bargy bargy and everyone's going to blame him when it all goes off. It's perfect. It's all queued up. If all the gunslingers are there, they like this. There's twitchy hands all over the place. The shoot up's about to happen. Um, and that's it. Okay, I'm Francis. I'm the crypto sniper and the market sniper and the reset sniper. Thank you for indulging me. Hope you enjoyed that.